So I'm bringing into studio today, chairperson of Action SA. It's important to touch base with Action SA because I think the last time we spoke to Action SA must have been in the lead up to the elections. So we haven't touched base with them and a lot has happened. Remember Action SA was a party that was its sole mission really was to help destroy the ANC. You'd laugh if I told you they're working with the ANC in Joburg. And there is a glimmer of light or some hope at least reading from the situation from some in action and say some in the ANC that they'll find one another in 20 and possibly reconfigure government in Ikuruleni so that we'll see more and more of these partnerships. And I think the question is, how did we get ya? Action and say was also the Vundekind, right? The Vundekind of the 2021 local government elections. They came out with 90 seats at the time. We go to elections this time around, and I think in total, they have around six seats in the national elections that took place in May. As I said, chair of the organization of the political party is in studio with me, Michael Bormont. He joins me now from studio. Michael, good morning. Thank you for joining us this week. No, it's great to be with you. I'm a big fan of the podcast, so I've had to wait five seasons for my invitation, <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Why don't you say you invited yourself? It's okay. It's true. I did, actually. I'll, I'll put it out there. Uh, but, you know, in politics, you can never be ashamed of those things. You no, must, uh, claim I love every that. chance you can, even if you've got to beg for them. A true uh, politician. <laughs> and hopefully there's not too much tricksing going on here today. We can keep it straight. Hopefully. Let's speak about how we got you, you know. You were really an, an interesting story of the 2021 elections. You went on to play quite a critical role in the formation of governments following the local government elections. You put your best foot forward, I think, as far as national elections were concerned. You had a machinery that spread through the length and breadth of the country, had premier candidates across all provinces, yet the results that you came out with were around six seats in total, I think, if I'm correct. How did that happen? Well, we're in a process of analyzing that. And let me be the first to say it was a disappointing result for us. We don't feel that we got the result that we worked for. But then again, I think it's important to look at this election in a context where, you know, one best described it as the election of tears. Because unless you were from MK or the Patriotic Alliance, you were in tears. I mean, the DA failed to reach 2014 levels of support. The EFF got cut. The Freedom Front got cut. There were very few parties with anything to celebrate in this election. And I think if anything... It says something a bit concerning about our political landscape, that rational centrist political parties are getting squeezed and growth is taking place on the extreme margins where messages like sending young pregnant girls to Robben Island and, you know, uh, turning off the life support machine of people at Rahima Musa is, is what voters rallied behind in this election. But, you know, there's no point in, in crying over spilt milk. There's plenty of things that we think we can do better going forward. And we aim to do exactly that. But I think to answer your your earlier point, we've also had to reevaluate our position. As a party, we've always been very strong in saying we won't work with the ANC, we won't do this, we won't do that, and setting really strong red lines in terms of what we will and won't do. And I think our review process has showed us that that painted ourselves into a bit of a corner, that actually perhaps as a four-year-old political party now, it may be more mature to say, let's take that decision on the merits of the issue at hand. Uh, and let's deal with it at that particular level about what's best for the residents of a particular municipality. As was evidenced in Johannesburg, we were able to get rid of Cabello Guamanda uh, in that process and assist in that particular transition. Uh, and that perhaps, you know, we should look at a political environment as an imperfect environment, but be willing to be pragmatic however we can in the best interests of the people who are affected by our decisions. You did attempt to preempt the elections in... We all understood that we we're headed towards a watershed election. We were part of what the, the was called, loosely called, a moonshot pack, but ultimately the multi-party charter, where you attempted to set the pace, to set the tone for power sharing post-elections, but you did this obviously pre the actual elections. Um, what were the lessons there? Do you regret going in that particular route? Do you think you're even punished for putting yourself in that space? Yeah, we, we suffered as a result of our involvement in the multi-party charter because really what the DA did is they used it to de-campaign their own partners. And they went to voters from Action SA and the Freedom Front Plus, for example, and said, well, you know, don't buy retail when you can just buy wholesale. Uh, and effectively, they took a huge amount of support in that process. But at the same time, our association with a party like the DA was toxic in black communities across South Africa as well. So that kind of double whammy really was a negative impact to us. 
I think from our point of view, we look at the decision to say it was the right thing to try and create a platform that was going to provide an alternative, but it was the wrong thing to consider that a party like the DA can genuinely be trusted when actually we said it at the time, the multi-party charter was a stalking horse for a relationship with the ANC and hey presto, here we are in September 2024 uh, and I think that view has been vindicated. I want to dissect that a little bit. Um, you speak about how the DAD campaign is partners. You had um, set rules about terms and conditions, right? Terms of, of reference in, in essence of how the MPC would function. Did they fail to take place? Did you fail to call each other to order? Because if you're being decampaigned by one of the partners, I imagine in a meeting you sit down and you say, you are campaigning negatively, which is something I knew actually they didn't want around the messaging as far as elections are concerned. What did you do? We did a lot. We raised those issues consistently in our internal engagements. And, you know, the focus was on dealing with them internally because you want to build confidence externally. You don't want to be externally fighting at a time when you want people to buy into and believe and have confidence in the project. But generally speaking, you know, what the DA would just do is, you know, proverbially uh, urinate on you and tell you it's raining, uh, to forgive the expression. <laughs> Uh, and that's exactly what they continued to do because you'd sit them down and say, hey, guys, you can't do that. This is wrong, etc." You go through weeks of fighting before they eventually capitulate, by which time four or five other things have happened. And the reality is, uh, as a resource analysis of parties in this organization, you know, the DA has the resources to have those fights internally within a group for days and days and days. When in fact, you know, your most important and prominent people in newer political parties are now involved in these internal scraps when they need to be out in the field campaigning, they can afford to be stuck in those battles when we couldn't. And I think from that point of view, we have to go back and ask ourselves a question, was there ever a genuine attempt to make the multi-party charter succeed? I don't think so. You say actually it was punished in essence by the negative perception of working with the DA and black communities. You didn't work with the DA in 2024. You've been working with the DA since the 2021 local government elections. Is it not too little too late? Your reflections are, are, are literally pointless now. Should this not have been something you were looking at from the very beginning of that relationship and constantly review, reviewing, even if it's a month-to-month -month basis, yeah. to figure out whether or not this is damaging your party? Truthfully, we should have picked it up a lot sooner. There's no question about that in our point of view. And as part of our internal discussions, uh, it's not about excuses, but I mean, in real terms, you know, we don't have the resources where we can run continuous tracking polls and market research in the way that established parties who at the time had access to parliamentary funding in ways that we didn't at the time. Uh, so, you know, you, you do have to fly on intuition and you do have to fly on fly blind a little bit in those regards. But, you know, TD, sometimes when you're looking at a situation about doing what's right, for our country, you also need to take the leap of faith. And we believed correctly so at the time, based on the information available to us, that working to build the alternative to the status quo was the right option. And we had to do so knowing that political parties who were planning to renege on that will get their comeuppance in the future. Actually, this is not part of the GNU, the government of national unity. Was that a mistake? No. And I, I maintain this to this day. I firstly don't call it a GNU. I'm like Helen Zilla. I call it a DAANC Grand Coalition. Um, and ultimately, you know, we look at something that we think is very ill-fated. Um, and I think if you look at the last 100 days, which I think was marked yesterday or day before, I think many ways we are more comfortable by our decision now than we were back then. And that's notwithstanding what we know is that South Africans, we are optimistic people. We look at the advent of a... GNU or before it, a Cyril Ramaphosa presidency or even before that a Jacob Zuma presidency and people find things to find encouragement in. And that's why you can actually say that there's an uptick in confidence and in certain indicators in the market and otherwise, but actually in real terms, what's changing? What reforms have arisen post the 29th of May? Because a policy Lakotla was supposed to take place. It's been radio silence coming out of that space. Instead, what we see is the NHI being you know, brought back to life. We see the Bella Bill coming into effect. We see the secrecy bill, you know, someone blowing the dust off that uh, and started to bring that back. We see the largest cabinet in the history of South African politics. Uh, we see the premeditated defense of Pala Pala 
emerging as coalition negotiations. And I'm going to venture a perspective here that at the end of this term of office, what we're actually going to see is a multi-party delivery of the same ANC failed politics that was voted out in 2024. Should that not worry you wanting to work with the ANC at local government level? Again, if you take the philosophy of saying we must make decisions based on who is impacted by those decisions. So I don't think we should take the decision on how we operate in Johannesburg based on KZN or the Western Cape or the Eastern Cape or some national consideration. I think we should base it just on Johannesburg. And the residents of that city owe, require us to take the very best decisions we can on their behalf, which is why we looked at a scenario of a mannequin of a mayor, if we are you know, honest with ourselves, in Cabello Guamanda, uh, and saying we need to do something here and we need to end the era where the EFF was holding government to hostage by rocking up to council meetings saying we're not going to pass a 2.4 billion rand loan agreement, which is part of our operating budget, unless you reinstate our, our MMC in Ikurleni. Now, if government is being held hostage to that extent, should Action SA sit on its 44 pairs of hands in Joburg, or should we say, hang on, those 44 pairs of hands represent hundreds of thousands of Joburg residents, and if they can be used to vote for the right things and to do the right things uh, in Johannesburg, then they should. But Michael, you're working with an ANC that believes in the concept of democratic centralism, if you may. They take the line of march in essence from national government. It is all good and well to say, Joburg, you want to look at it as a unique region that you're dealing with and don't compare it to the next province or the next region or national politics. But in the ANC, in the way they do politics, whatever is happening on the ground is very much influenced by the national space, decision makers and the politics at play at national level, you can't actually escape it. These are the people you've now got into bed with. Well, I mean, I, I would avoid the term gone into bed. Uh, Same I difference? Think, no, no, no. I think that's politicsing a little bit there. I think there's a slight difference <laughs> there because what we're talking about in Johannesburg is a relationship where we haven't signed a coalition agreement. We're not co-governing in the executive. We are not bound to be voting with the coalition on every issue. We are free to use our votes on an issue-by-issue -issue basis based solely on the merits of the question at hand. And I would say that's quite far away from the kind of arrangement that would constitute being in bed with. And notwithstanding the fact that everything you say about the ANC is correct, but Action SA must make decisions based on Action SA and not another political party. Yes, we must be mindful that that's how the ANC operates. But at the end of the day, if you're going to operate in a space where we must be cautious of every political party in the way in which they operate because of their many, many uh, downsides and the misgivings we have for them. Then who are we going to work with in a team sport of coalition politics? Because ultimately, the DA has proven to be fundamentally untrustworthy. The EFF has proven, proven to be extractive uh, in their approach to coalition politics. The ANC, as you say, democratic centralism driven from the national national structures. So, you know, Action SA is going to very soon, if we don't be careful about our decision making, end up in a corner with nobody to play with and no ability to serve the people we're meant to serve. How very real is a threat? Um, you are 18 months away from the next cycle of elections. You've done really well in 2021. 2024 showed you that you can't afford to be comfortable. How real is that possibility? Well, it's always there. I mean, a, a new political party lives on a knife's edge. I mean, when you're doing well, you're still just on the right side of the knife's edge. And we, we never we never lose sight of that. And we never have. And I, I would hate to think it was anything to do with complacency because I certainly don't think that's what it was. We worked incredibly hard in the 2024 campaign. Uh, but ultimately, we are confident that we have an exciting offer for South Africans, particularly at the local government level. I think if anything... Uh, South Africans have said that they, they like their action local. We've got a lot more work to convince them that provincially and nationally we are the force to be reckoned with. But luckily, uh, as a unofficial opposition in parliament, we've got a good space to start to get that right. But at a local government level, the support behind Action SA remains considerable. The kind of identity politics that was such a big factor in this election definitely comes much less in a local government election when the question becomes much more about how much you hate your mayor and your ward councillor, which I think is a much easier terrain for action to say to be contesting in. Let's speak about Swani a little bit. Um, Sidney so Brink says you don't answer his phone calls. <laughs> You've been taking the mayor. 
he, he seems a little bit uh, personalizing this issue and, and taking it a bit upset. And you know, let me give you the context because it's a bit of a human story here rather than a political strategy. Uh, we did chat a little bit over WhatsApp and the idea was to have a meeting. And then I had a incident with my eye where I had to go for surgery and I was out for a few days. Uh, and as I was recovering, I started reading media reports about my lack of replying to him. But when you realize you're dealing with a person who is going to publicly put out there what you are talking with in private, what confidence can I have that engaging this individual is going to serve any particular purpose? And as part of a broader subject about the DA and coalition, because I think with the greatest of respect, there's a lot of, you know, listeners in this kind of environment who I think, you know, have got their blinkers on and their blind spots when it comes to the DA. Because let's look at a DA where Action SA can't work with them anymore. The Freedom Front increasingly can't work with them anymore. The Patriotic Alliance can't work with them anymore. We're getting phone calls from national leaders in the ANC saying, how on earth do you do this? Because we can't do it anymore. At some point, DA supporters might have to open their eyes to the possibility that it's not everybody else. It might, in fact, be them. And in that regard, you know, I wanted to share a few anecdotes with you because sure. you know, this isn't some vague, nondescript, wafty kind of concept. These are real issues. In the city of China, there was the four-month strike last year, which brought service delivery to its knees, which I was remember precipitated that. by the city of China, the government of which we were a part, refusing to pay two out of three years of legally agreed wage increase agreements, which have the effect of law and collective bargaining. Now, we're part of this government. We went through every appeal process within our coalition structure to say you can't do that legally, or even if you just say financially, because now you have a contingent liability of more than one billion rand owing to municipal workers, which can become due the moment the Labour Appeals Court looks at this and says, what on earth are you doing? And we form part of this government. And to this day, every offer that's been taken back to the union since then has not even been consulted with Action SA, much less to our knowledge of what it was. And that's how we get treated as a coalition partner. So when Salir's cries crocodile tears about the fact that I don't respond to his WhatsApps, you know, my heart is not pumping lumpy custard because actually he's proven time and time again that actually the DA's idea of a coalition is that they govern and we just give them a majority. So that's the one part of this conversation around 20. But I do know that you've also, as a political party, kind of made an assessment because I think there's been criticism that in the back and forth, we don't hear anything about the residents of Tswane, about what their well-being is about. We're hearing political parties that are going back and forth about why they can't work with one another and residents are left behind. Yeah, and I think it's a fair observation because, you know, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of the comms has been, as you say, between parties, the fundamental part of our review, which led to our decision to leave coalition with the city of China, wasn't based on any of the backwards and forwards between the parties. It was actually based on a thorough process we did to evaluate the position of the city of China as a government. And you've got to remember, and I'm, let me get this out of the way up front, we don't have amnesia about the fact that we have been part of this government. We're not pointing at these issues saying it's you, it's not us. Uh, you know, it's true that we don't have the mayor, we don't have the finance the MMC, and we don't have the utilities portfolio. But you've got the deputy mayor, you form part of the government. Sure, I mean, since the beginning of this year, yes. But at the end of the day, we don't disown the fact that we are part of that government. Mm. But if you're part of a government that is problematic, do you just say, well, we must just stick it through, or do you take an action or two? And from our point of view, that action has been born of the following. One, City of Chinese audit outcomes is qualified audits the same as Mangung and Buffalo City. It had 2.5 billion rands worth of irregular expenditure and 1.3 billion rands in fruitless and wasteful expenditure in the last financial year published. Now, all these people who are cheerleading Salia's brink would be throwing rotten tomatoes at an ANC mayor for these performance figures. But apparently performance is based on which party you come from rather than some standard notion. So there's a thing such as a, a DA exception in yeah, no, ba bad government from a DA mayor apparently is better for certain people, which is their right. But I think, you know, if we're going to try and grow up a little bit as a country and, and be mature about it, bad performance is bad performance. And good That's performance correct. is good performance. I was going to ask you if that, 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 that analysis on whether bad DA governance is good, it's better 
Where does it come from? Where I think does it must it have come from, from Helen Zilla's comment that poverty in the Western Cape is better than poverty anywhere well, else. It must have maybe, that's the the, maybe that's maybe the origin of this. Could have come I mean, from us. But continuing further, I mean, yeah. let me just you know walk down this road with you a bit. I mean, the capital budget in the city of Chwane is being halved from 4 billion rand per year at the start of this term of office to 2.1 billion rand per year. That's all of the infrastructure comes from that budget. By way of comparison, city of Cape Town is 11 billion rand. Etikweni, Mkolisi Kaunda, the terrible mayor who had yes. to be removed, yes. 8.1 billion rand. Chwane is on 2.1. And at the end of the day, we're looking at a city where that low level of infrastructure spend is translating into service delivery failures, particularly in the townships, where our review conducted market research, TD, that shows that over 75% of people living in townships either say it's gotten worse or it hasn't changed. Now, we are a political party in this coalition that has a constituency in those communities in the way that the DA and the Freedom Front actually do not. And we can't form part of a government that is underperforming in that way. And I don't think we should really be in the age of 2024 and have to say whether delivery should go to a suburb or a township. Surely it can go to both in a democratic South Africa. Are you not worried about the possibility of working with an ANC and then fighting over the same electorate, the same constituency? I mean, I know some in the DA who think Action SA is better off under the current conditions, or at least the coalition you walked away from, because they're not competing for votes in Amanskral. You're going to be fishing the same pond with an ANC. There is that argument being made earlier. You spoke about the impact of working with the DA on townships. Um, it'll be harder, you, I imagine, if you're with the ANC and possibly with the EFF. Well, let's put it this way. And let's understand what makes Action SA unique. We win support in all communities. The ANC and EFF get support only in townships and informal settlements, rarely, and the DA and Freedom Front only in the suburbs. What makes Action SA's challenge in a city, which is only delivering in the suburbs and not in the townships, difficult, is that we have support on both sides of the proverbial railway track. And we have to deal with that dynamic, which has proven to be very difficult. So we're always going to be competing with someone in coalition. We're always going to have someone with whom we're competing for with votes. But at the end of the day, TD, let's bring this back down to the residents. Because if we are, if we are coalition partners, we're also competitors. Every political party who's in a coalition is also competing with one another. The question is whether that competition can be handled in a mature way that puts the needs of the people that are meant to be served ahead of party political interests. And I think that's been a fundamental challenge because the DA sees the need to choke coalition partners with whom it is a competitor rather than collaborate. Hmm. Um, where are matters now as it stands? Uh, last I heard the ANC needed to make a decision. I saw reports saying that it might have made a decision to have a local unit, a local unit situation uh, in Swani. From where Action SA sits, where are things? Well, I mean, you're probably going to roll your eyes a bit with me when I tell you this, but, you know, we may be as in the dark as you are because uh, this is all playing out in the ANC. The ANC nationally is pushing them towards a deal with the DA. Uh, the ANC provincially, I gather, is resisting that. Uh, we don't know how it's going to play out. But, you know, TD, when we started this process, we were always quite clear that our resolution at, at that point in our Senate was to get out of this coalition once we had completed our review. In other words, the performance of this government means we need to indemnify ourselves from any further involvement in this particular government. And we were always mindful that the DA and the ANC might cook up a deal because you've got to remember this whole thing started with the DA and the ANC trying to translate GNU, GPU down to a GLU. Yes, yeah, so it needs to be all the way down to GLU. It only failed because it failed in Gauteng province. And the DA leaders have repeatedly been on record to say that they are going to form an arrangement with the ANC in these metros in Gauteng. So what I find astonishing with the shrill nature of... of DA supporters who now want to scream blue murder, if you'll forgive the expression, is really all we're doing is what their party was planning to do as well. It's amazing you how it's acceptable. Surprising. Yeah, because they are quite upset and very vocal about how they feel about the way Action is carrying itself. But if you look at it, you're like, but the DA is also in talks. I think the argument they try and make is that somebody entered talks before the other, and the assumption is you started seeking relationship outside of the agreement that they sought reassurance that the coalition was intact in 20, which they claim to have received. 
yet there were reports. I can tell you for free. I said it long ago that that mayor should not feel comfortable, that Celia Brink should not feel comfortable. I saw that coming a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the point is this. Right after the May 29 elections, and I mean, here's some insights that you might not have, but the very first meeting of the multi-party charter took place three days after the May 29 elections. You hear it first with Sidi Madia. Eh? And at that meeting, we were supposed to talk about pathways to building majorities where there actually were pathways in places like Gauteng and other areas. And what was very clear when we entered that meeting is that the discussion between the DA, the IFP, the Freedom Front, had been with the ANC already. And effectively, we were attending the second meeting, which was a formality. The meeting with the other group had already taken place, and they had made their decision to go in with the ANC. Immediately after that, the DA were publicly talking about bringing the ANC into these coalitions in China, Johannesburg, and elsewhere, and kicking us out, which is fine. That's absolutely their right. This isn't personal. But at the end of the day, that is why I find it hard for those shrill types to sit and run and scream about how the DA is being treated in this process when, in fact, the DA was doing exactly the same to us in the first place. So coming back to today, you are in the dark, you're waiting. I think I have a slightly better understanding of where things are. Mm. Still in the dark. <laughs> Still waiting. Um, what happens if the ANC's perspective at national level wins? Well, then it wins, and the ANC and the DA get what they always wanted, which was a coalition in the Gauteng metros at that level. I suppose the ANC provincially and that grouping of the ANC gets pretty badly humiliated, which thankfully is not my problem, that's theirs. But at the end of the day, if winning is the DA and the ANC co-governing a dysfunctional and bankrupt municipality together two years out from the local government elections, well, then I'm really happy not to win. What, what would be the impact on the relationship we've already formulated in Joburg? Uh, does it matter what happens in 20? Does it undo the work that was done? I know there were multiple meetings and agreements to get to Joburg. Well, it's something we're going to have to consider. I don't think there's been enough time since the weekend reports for us to really contemplate that question. But I would suggest to you that the guiding principle behind that answer is ultimately going to be what's right for the residents of Joburg. And I would think that we are in a position there to deliver value, to provide accountability, and to offer a pool of votes whenever other political parties are being silly with theirs. And at the end of the day, that is a public good for the residents of Joburg that I don't think we should necessarily forego because of what happened in China. We must deal with it for residents and in the municipality in question. What are you doing to retain the support that you had in 2021 at local government and to even grow that? Well, we're doing many things, I suppose, but it, it starts with going back to the ground and building your structures because at the end of the day, uh, political parties that have growth prospects are the ones that exist at a street corner and at a community level. Uh, and that's so important in a local government context where the issues change from national political identity to the street light outside my home and refuse collection and all the other burning issues that exist at a local government level. You know, we tend to be better orientated at a local level. Our DNA is more orientated at that level. And I think that alongside some really important work we want to do on Canada selection, we are going to be changing the formula on Canada selection at a local government level quite fundamentally because so often we see councillors being elected who are a constituency of one. Uh, they are the leader and they're also the follower and that's where it starts and ends. And we want to really start to find ways of working with communities to identify people that have followings, yes, politically, but more importantly, they have followings because they serve communities and they've got a credible background. And I think that's going to be a major point of, 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 of assessment. I would also say, TD, from a strategic point of view, one of the things we want to correct in the next election is to perhaps not spread ourselves as thinly as we did in this election. Mm. From a resource point of view, in hindsight, nine provinces was very, very difficult for us to compete with at the level of resources that we had. We probably got outspent uh, at a national level about 20, 25 to 1 to the established political players, if you want to call them that. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think we have the ability at a local government level to select particular places that will allow us to play to our strengths, but also to create footholds in a province from which we can grow outwards to the next national and provincial elections. A question that I hear often asked of action to say is, when is the elective conference? 
well, probably March next year, a constitution prescribes nine months after a general election like the one we had in May. We're having to go through a fairly major overhaul of our membership and branch system as we speak, which is underway. Uh, but all the pressure is being placed on our structures so we can get there. There's never been any intention other than to go to an elective conference. Uh, some people get very excitable by this question. By the way, they're not Action SA members. Action SA members appear quite content, but people outside our party seem to want to have a strong voice in terms of how our party is run, which is really weird. Uh, but that's fine. People have their views. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, leaders like Herman and myself, we, we, we don't shy away from those kind of things. Those are great opportunities to bring our party together and be accountable as leaders. And we're very confident in that process. Do you feel you still have the appetite to continue? I mean, it's early days, but it's actually been a lot. It's been an eventful couple of years for action, let's say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always you know, out of the pot and into the fire in politics because you go from one cycle to another. And this next cycle is so brutal because there's only a two-year gap between the national and the provincial versus the local. So, yeah, it's definitely um, you know, getting the cobwebs out and really trying to get going with strategy and implementation. But, you know, I think the point is whether, whether or not we are ready for it, it's coming. And South Africans, we must understand while the spotlight is on national government, understandably, because of this novelty of a GNU grand coalition is the fuel price really coming down because of investor confidence? There's some serious metric economics going on there. <laughs> but at the, end, at the end of the day... You do not need to ask Michael what he thinks. We know it already. Well, yeah. sitting on the fence is no fun. But at the end of the day, uh, I think we must understand the greatest constitutional crises facing South Africans are of a local government nature. That's where they're sitting in sewerage. That's when the water's not flowing. That's when the electricity is unstable. And that's why we must orientate ourselves towards local government being the next frontier. I can't let you go without asking this because you actually did work with them at some point. When you see reports that the Minister of Agriculture, John Stenison, had to ask Roman Cabinet to resign and that this hasn't necessarily happened, what comes to mind? It just shows that a lot of things that have been presented by the so-called opposition in South Africa has just been because of a lack of opportunity rather than principle. So this is a political party that has stood on the rooftops and screamed, appropriately so, by the way, about not having cater deployment and not having nepotism and having the highest standards possible for appointing people into important office. And yet the best talent the DA can find to fill the position as the political head in the Minister of Agriculture's office is a controversial social media bigot uh, who, you know, claimed to fame as dealing with deceased estates. I think there's a major question mark about this government and perhaps to suggest that a lot of the differences in principle between the government and the opposition in the past have purely been about a lack of opportunity rather than a different in ethics. Does it shock you? You were once somebody who used to wear blue. You used to be part of the DA. Did you ever imagine that if the DA finds itself in power, you would see what they complained about as NC failures being part and parcel of what's on display by their leaders. Yeah, I did actually. But I mean, I saw that when we were in the city of Joburg. Uh, and I mean, look, I don't like to dwell on issues of the DA as long in my rear view mirror. And I don't think I'd recognize that party if I were to walk in there now. But one of the things we saw is that, you know, when it comes to the DA being ready to govern outside of the Western Cape, particularly, it's a myth. Uh, in fact, the idea that the DA delivers outside of the Western Cape is just not evident at all. Uh, and when we took on Johannesburg in that complex minority seven-way coalition government, what you saw is a political party that didn't have depth in terms of people who can provide leadership in the municipalities. Uh, it didn't actually have strongly capable, competent civil servants who could, who could actually lead departments and be qualified to do so in the process. And what we also saw was a party that didn't have the maturity to understand the complexity of government because now, being in opposition is really easy. You just you know, scream and shout and you issue statements and you're outraged by this and outraged by that. But actually being in government, you've got to deal with complexities and you've got to balance realities and you've got to deal with a situation where, you know, an egg's going to get broken to make this omelette. And, you know, there wasn't always that maturity there in that process. And I don't think it's gotten any better since. Um, as we wrap up, I expect Action say, for the good or bad, to be judged quite harshly 
over how it's managed or handled this back and forth around the ANC elections. What do you say to potential voters around how you've navigated the space and how you want them to make sense? I know you, earlier you said that it, you recognize that you don't operate in an imperfect system, but voters are watching and are in shock. I think every day on our stations, people are even blaming the potential demise of Swani actually on Action and Say saying that they believe there was some progress being made, that Action and Say pulling out will be costly. Um, people look at Joburg and people again look at an Action and Say that can today congratulate an ANC for how it handled itself in those co-governance um, co talks. Well, I think there's many things we'd have to say and we've got two years to say it, which I think is the first important point. But at the end of the day, I think over those two years, what we're quite confident about is that our views in the city of Chuane will be vindicated. Because ultimately speaking, there is, no, there is no factual basis for people to say things are getting better. Every single indicator about the city of Chuane has gotten worse. And I think people who say it's gotten better, if they could you know, introspect a little bit and ask themselves this question, what's gotten better and can they answer that question? Suddenly they find themselves probably having to come to terms with the fact that in their minds it's gotten better because someone who they identify more with is in government rather than there's any particular performance that they can point at and say, this is tangibly better. If they have seen improvements, they're very lucky uh, not to live in the townships of China, where I have been traveling and witnessing great horrifics. But I would also say to them that we should aspire to live in a country where service delivery shouldn't be a trade-off between haves and have-nots. I think we can aspire to deliver services on both sides of the proverbial railway track, and we should. And I think we should feel ashamed to defend service delivery that's only orientated behind one particular side. But ultimately, I believe we will be vindicated. But in the city of Chuane, what we've had is many years of failed ANC government. We've had eight years of failed DA government, eight years. And yet they, they, they point to the ANC's track record in Chuane, like Jacob Zuma pointed to Jan van Riebeck. It's the, it's the ANC's fault from eight years ago. You can't imagine how they continue to do so. And perhaps to and say to those people... argument is not necessarily without facts, without merits. It's long-winded, but somewhere deep down there, there's a thing. But okay, I hear you. At the end of the day, you know, maybe it's time for a third party to demonstrate its brand of government, to demonstrate that it can be done on both sides. Herman Mashaba, still fit for purpose? Of course. Herman Mashaba is the person with probably the most credible track record in turning around broken municipalities. Uh, he's got the track record of leadership in business and bringing that into a political space. He's not a politician. Uh, mm -hmm. And Herman will be the very first one to tell you no, that. We all know he's not a politician. And he's and he proud of it. it. He's proud he of it. it. Who wants I to be a politician in this environment? I mean, it's like self-identifying <laughs> with, with the me. sludge of society. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, he's I a proven leader. sludge of society sounds... Is the best way to describe our politicians. Sure. Um, Present company excluded, of course. Uh, no, I disagree. Present company <laughs> included. Uh, <laughs> Michael, how, in terms of appetite, though, I always feel like Herman doesn't have the appetite to stick around. Um, he was at local government. He left to prepare for national elections. He didn't even make it to parliament. Uh, so he's focusing on local government again. So that almost gives me a sense that he has no appetite and this is leading to be in the room. No, not at all. I think uh, it's a, a rare thing in South Africa where most politicians will eat their own young for another position. Uh, the fact that Herman Mashaba doesn't neither here nor there, whether he's in parliament and quite frankly, you know, Herman would be the first to say, you know, maybe I'm not the best person to be going from one committee room to another committee room. And there may be people in my party that are going to be better suited to that. But in a short two year turnaround in local government, I want to be in communities, in the service delivery issues, giving hope to people in a way that you just can't do when you're part time. Uh, and the fact that we've got people like Athol Trollope and Jose Leclape and people of that Jose ilk. Jose no, incredible. Is incredible. And if you've it's got that impressive. depth of leadership, yeah. then yeah. you should use yeah. it to your advantage. Okay, I'll take it. Michael Bowman, National Chair of Action Essence.